This lecture will cover Schistosoma mansoni, Hematobium, and Japonicum, the fluke trematodes of Schistosomiasis. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The goals for this lecture on Schisto are to understand how it happens, so you can break that life cycle, know who gets the infection, and recognize the clinical presentation. That presentation will vary depending on the phase of infection in the patient who presents in your clinic. Know how to confirm your suspicion with diagnostic testing, and get familiar with treatment options. So this is our map of parasites, and we're in the trematode, or fluke, section. Schistosomes are blood flukes, and although there are three main species, Mansoni, Hematobium, and Japonicum, they all share basically the same adult morphology. And they look like this. The male, at a glance, looks like a round worm, but in fact, he is flat, or fluke-shaped. But he has folded himself in half, to form a central groove or cleft or schist, and into that schist goes the female. He is holding on to her for dear life so that they can engage in continuous sexual intercourse throughout their entire adult lives. Seven years, perhaps, of continuously pumping out eggs, nothing but eggs. Now, the eggs have different shapes depending on the species. That's not important for this phase of your training. What is important is to recognize that all three species have essentially the same life cycle. So the life cycle starts when an infected human either urinates or defecates into the water. In the urine or the feces, there are eggs that are infectious. The eggs hatch. A little animal called a mericidium is born. It seeks out a snail. Every snail is specific to each species of schistosomiasis. The snail serves as an intermediate host where the schistosome will develop over time. After one or two months, out comes a cercaria. This is a very active, motile animal with a forked tail, and it swims vigorously through the water looking for its next victim. Let's zoom in on that person. What's happening in the bottom right is that the cercaria has reached human skin, and it is burrowing its way into the skin. It drops the tail, Stay, stays just with its head like a warhead that gets into the skin and then gets swept away into the circulation. Within just a few minutes, the head of that cercaria will enter circulation. Now, over time, it will develop gradually into an adult, either male or female. They can be anywhere, but they really like the portal blood. They like to be in the liver because Presumably, it's a very nutrient-rich environment for them to live on. Over time, uh, those males and females will mature into adults, usually in the portal system, and then they will crawl, energetically crawl, against the flow of venous blood, either to the mesenteric venous plexus, that's for Schistosoma mansoni or Japonicum, or uh, into the veins that drain the bladder and the seminal vesicle, that's for Schistosoma hematobium. When that happens, they lay eggs, thousands and thousands of these eggs. And the point of the eggs is to get back into the environment and complete the life cycle. For Japonicum and Mansoni, they try to get into the poop through the colon wall. In Hematobium, they try to get through the bladder into the urine. The problem is that these things don't always go where they're supposed to. They can end up anywhere, including trapped right in the tissue of the colon wall or the bladder. When that happens, the body will react. It will send in eosinophils to try to create a granuloma, in effect walling off this foreign invader. So much of the disease of schistosomiasis relates to this problem of the immune response to these microscopically small eggs. The epidemiology of schisto, well, it varies a bit by species, but as you can see, each of them has tens of millions of people involved in geographically distinct areas. They are generally thought to be anthroponoses, although in the case of Schistosoma japonicum, it turns out that water buffaloes are perfectly happy homes for Japanese, so-called Japanese schisto, and that makes it even tougher for health control officers to bring the infection under control there. The bottom line is that today on planet Earth, one out of every 30 humans has this infection. That's 200,000 deaths annually. It can happen any place where there's uncontrolled snail populations, and people who don't have a better choice where they should pee or poop. The picture you see here is a problem of the times. This is an irrigation canal that was built out of very good intentions because uh, they wanted to bring this West African community a better way to irrigate their crops and make them more self-sustainable. Unfortunately, uh, 
It's a perfect setup for schisto because you have number one, weeds and reeds growing on the side of the canal. That's where the snails will thrive because they can lay their eggs. Number two, you have people. There's no outhouse, there's no sewage system. Where else are they gonna pee and poop? So this is a case study in unintended consequences and it has played out time and time again uh, throughout uh, Africa in particular, and India as well. Now, how will this present clinically? Well, it totally depends on the phase of infection in your patient. Remember, acute infection is circarial dermatitis. That's where the circaria has lost its tail, the head is burrowing through your dermis and getting into the circulation. On the way, it shows itself off as a new antigen to the dendritic cells that live within your skin, and that can cause an intensely itchy rash as the allergic response happens. Although it is self-limited and benign, it will go away by itself. Now, many of you have probably had this without even knowing it. In the USA, we have a disease called swimmer's itch. That's bird schisto, not human schisto, but bird schisto. There are some species of schisto that are specific to ducks and geese and swans. When they land in the pond or the lake where you go swimming, they poop, and in the bird poop, there are uh, schisto uh, organisms. Those organisms will get into a snail and then get back out into the water looking for more birds. If they get into you by accident, they can't make it through your dermis. Something about the human dermis is tougher than bird dermis, but boy, they sure do elicit a nasty, itchy response. Many of you may have had this before. Now, over time, as those uh, parasites develop inside the body, in particular in the portal blood, you may actually see something called Katayama syndrome or Katayama fever. This happens when the male and female have matured into adults, they have started to mate, and they've started to lay eggs. We think that Katayama syndrome is an allergic type response to new antigens, egg antigens. It presents with fever and chills, shakes, that's what we call rigors, myalgia, that's muscle pain, arthralgia, that's joint pain, lymphadenopathy, that's big swollen lymph nodes, hepatomegaly, that's a big liver. This is a systemic inflammatory response that will last for days or weeks and then usually goes away by itself. The allergic response to those egg antigens calms down. Unfortunately, there are cases in which the antigen load is huge and for whatever reason related to the host, the immune response is so big that they can develop shock, which is a system of which is a systemic issue related to uh, low blood pressure, even coma or death. And then there's chronic schisto. Chronic schisto is all about the eggs. It's all about how many eggs are inside your tissue. Remember, the adults can live for years. They'll lay thousands of eggs per day. In the case of schistosoma hematobium, most of the eggs are laid in the veins of the bladder and burrow their way out through the bladder wall. And this causes a variety of problems. Number one, where the eggs leave the bladder wall, you can have bleeding. And so hematuria, or bloody urine, is a leading issue. Number two, some of the eggs actually do not make their way out. They get stuck in the wall of the bladder. The body responds by bringing eosinophils, creating granulomas, and that can cause scar. And a scarred urinary bladder may not work as well as it should otherwise. Finally, if this process goes on over time, there's so much turnover on the lining of the bladder wall that you can end up with cancer, a squamous cell carcinoma. Most cancers of the bladder are transitional cell, but the cancer related to schistosomiasis is classically a squamous cell carcinoma. And in the case of schistosoma mansoni or japonicum, it's a very similar story, except we're talking about the colon and not the urinary bladder. So as the eggs get out of the colon wall into the poop, they can injure the colon wall, and you can end up with hematochesia, that's blood in the stool. Similarly, we can end up with wall of the colon that is scarred down with eosinophilic granulomas. You can well imagine that a scarred down granulomatous colon will not work properly, and these patients may develop chronic diarrhea and other bowel problems. Now, in all cases, japonicum, mansoni, hematobium, sometimes the eggs don't even stay where they're supposed to stay. They can get swept up into the systemic circulation and go any place they choose. Spine, brain, you name it. But by far, it's the liver. Usually it's the liver where those eggs will end up. And when you have a lot of microscopic eggs in your liver and an immunologic response to those eggs, you can develop a disease called portal hypertension. You will learn more about portal hypertension, but in effect, what happens is the liver is no longer able to adequately filter the incoming blood. Blood backs up 
and this causes, number one, the retention of fluid in the belly. That's called ascites. Number two, we can have abnormal blood vessel connections between the portal and the systemic vascular system. This can cause varices, very dilated blood vessels in the esophagus, for example. This can cause big hemorrhoids in the rectum. Those things can rupture and bleed, and bleeding is indeed the leading cause of death among patients who have schistosomiasis. So how do you make a diagnosis? Number one, look for the acute infection. Recognize that rash if swimmers itch. If you're in North America, it's just bird schisto. If you're dealing with someone from the tropics, that may actually be human schistosomiasis setting up a systemic infection. Number two, don't forget about Katayama syndrome. If your patient presents with high eosinophil count, high fever, uh, a systemic illness characterized by low blood pressure, think about Katayama. Find out if they went swimming or were exposed to the water uh, a couple of months earlier than that. And finally, for chronic schisto, these patients really should have a high eosinophil count. They should have a serology test that is absolutely positive. And you can check their poop or their urine for eggs. In the case of schistosoma hematobium, have them pee in a cup. And if you look at that urine and you see these eggs, well, there's nothing else that could cause this. You've made your diagnosis. What do we do to treat schisto? We kill the worms. And as is true for most trematode or fluke infections, praziquantol is the anti-helminthic of choice. In the case of schisto, that's not enough, because even after you've killed the adults, the eggs may already have made their way into tissues, and they may have caused significant damage. In the case of liver disease, they have to have meticulous liver care, no viral hepatitis, no alcohol, no overdosing on Tylenol, etc. And you also have to watch them carefully for cancer. In the case of schistosoma hematobium, make sure they do not develop one of those squamous cell carcinomas. Breaking the cycle of schisto is all about enhancing sanitation, giving people a viable option to deposit their feces in their urine, controlling snail populations, going after the snails by hand or more often using uh, agents that kill off snails in the water, and also periodically going into these highly affected communities and giving them praziquantel. If you do that periodically, even if they have some schisto adults, those adults will be killed within the body and their egg burden will gradually diminish. So the key concepts for schistosomiasis are that it is a trematode of three different species. It's transmitted when human waste gets into the water, then gets into snails, and finally gets into human skin. It happens throughout the trop tropics where sanitation is poor. Acutely, there will be a swimmer's itch. Subacutely, a couple months later, there's Katayama syndrome, and chronically, it's all about schisto that is chronic due to eggs in your bladder, in your colon, in your liver. Make a diagnosis by looking for eosinophilia, sending serology, and looking for eggs in the feces or the urine for patients with chronic schisto. We treat with praziquantel, and we manage those complications, especially liver complications, so carefully. Improving sanitation and controlling the snails really should be the key to prevention. Thank you for your attention.